The Gila monster is the only venomous lizard native to the United States. It has a fearsome reputation for having a toxic breath and a fatally venomous bite. How does this fearsome creature have anything to do with diabetes? Watch on to find out. Welcome to the channel. Today, we'll be summarizing the results of the Amplitude O trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine and also presented during the American Diabetes Association's 81st Scientific Sessions. This study was funded by Sanofi, the pharmaceutical company. Diabetes is a chronic metabolic disease causing abnormally high blood glucose levels due to either insulin deficiency or relative insulin resistance. The latter, classified as type 2 diabetes, makes up the majority of cases. Many drugs are available on the market for the treatment of type 2 diabetes including metformin, TPP4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Many of these have also been shown to improve disease outcomes in other conditions. For example, SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and chronic kidney disease progression, while GLP-1 receptor agonists were seen as beneficial in preventing cardiovascular events, including stroke. Earlier trials also showed that GLP-1 receptor agonist drugs based on human GLP-1 could reduce kidney events. I've recently summarized a study involving semaglutide, a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Click on the link in the description below if you want to know more. GLP-1 receptor agonists work via the incretin effect by augmenting insulin secretion to reduce blood sugar levels, as well as reducing gastric emptying, thereby slowing the rate of nutrient absorption and reducing food intake. The result is increased satiety and eventually weight loss, which also benefits diabetics who are commonly obese. GLP-1 analogs can be classified into three categories, exenin-based, DPP-4-resistant, and human-derived. Exenotype, the first ever GLP-1 drug, was derived from the venom of the Gila monster. Scientists subsequently formulated similar drugs in the laboratory, and these were labeled DPP-4-resistant only because these were not based on desert venom. Contrary to popular belief, exenin-based drugs are also DPP-4-resistant. In recent years, the trend has been for pharmaceutical companies to manufacture human-derived alternatives whose drug molecules are conjugated to substances such as fatty acids and albumin, mainly to slow renal excretion. f paglenotide bucks the trend by being an exendin-based GLP-1 receptor agonist rather than a human-based one. The agent was first developed by the South Korean-based Hanmi Pharmaceutical but was later licensed out to Sanofi during clinical testing. In 2020, last year, Sanofi returned all rights for f back to Hanmi, citing a change in their company's focus on drug development. In any case, Amplitude O and its sister trial Amplitude M have been completed and recently presented in the 81st Scientific Sessions of the American Diabetes Association. Amplitude O was designed to evaluate the effects of weekly injections of f on cardiovascular and renal outcomes in type 2 diabetics with high cardiovascular risk compared to placebo. This was designed to be both a non-inferiority and superiority trial. This was a randomized controlled trial conducted over two and a half years involving 4,076 participants in 28 countries with type 2 diabetes and other cardiovascular risk factors such as heart disease, kidney disease, and hypertension. They were equally split into groups receiving a weekly injection of either f 4-mg, 6-mg, or placebo. Most were treated for 1.8 years. Patients had a mean HbA1c of 8.9% and had diabetes for an average of 15 years. Many were already on diabetic medications, including 15% on an SGLT2 inhibitor, which was continued on throughout the trial. Of note, randomization was stratified according to SGLT2 inhibitor use. The researchers excluded patients who were recently on either a DPP4 inhibitor or GLP1 receptor agonist, as they both work via the incretin pathway and may confound the trial results. The primary outcome was the first incidence of a major adverse cardiovascular event, or MACE, which the investigators defined as a composite of cardiac death, non-fatal heart attack, or stroke. Other outcomes investigated was the rate of adverse events, as well as the incidence of first significant renal event, a composite of macroalbuminuria, and decreased in renal function. And here are the results. Those of epiglionotide saw a 27% risk reduction for a cardiovascular event compared with placebo, and this met statistical significance for both non-inferiority and superiority. In other words, an estimated 46 similar patients would need to be treated with epiglionotide for 1.8 years 
to prevent one major adverse cardiovascular event. The positive effect of epiglenotide was seen regardless of factors such as age, sex, duration of diabetes, baseline HbA1c level, and whether participants were taking an SGLT2 inhibitor. An exploratory analysis also suggested the presence of the dose response effect, with the 4MG and 6MG epiglenotide doses being associated with a non significant 18% and a significant 35% risk reduction versus placebo, respectively. The intervention arm also yielded a 32% reduced risk for the composite renal outcome. As expected with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, gastrointestinal side effects occurred in the treatment group, the most common of which included diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting, and bloating. Severe gastrointestinal events occurred only in about 1.5% more in the treatment group compared to placebo. This study shows that epiglenotide offers significant benefits in cardiovascular and renal outcomes in the high-risk population with multiple cardiovascular risk factors, while maintaining a reasonable safety and tolerability profile consistent with the GLP-1 receptor agonist class. This also highlights the viability of exendin-based GLP-1 receptor agonists compared with human-based ones such as liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide. Surprisingly, the trial also showed that those of SGLT2 inhibitors which reduced blood sugar levels through a separate mechanism of action, did not have a better outcome than others in the trial. This finding comes despite recommendations from some experts that high-risk diabetics should take a combination of anti-diabetic medications to capitalize on additive cardiovascular benefits. There are of course some caveats. First, the average follow-up period was relatively short, at 1.8 years, and that could have masked certain findings had follow-up been done for a longer period. For example, usage of SGLT2 inhibitors could possibly have showed a difference in outcomes had follow-up been done for a longer period. Secondly, as the trial selected for participants with multiple cardiovascular risk factors, we are able to generalize the results to a lower risk population. However, given that patients with type 2 diabetes that require a second or third anti-diabetic agent like f usually already have multiple cardiovascular risk factors, this may not matter so much in actual clinical practice. Hope you've learned something from this video. Please like and subscribe for more of such videos. Thank you!